Polyglot. We love it. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Um, we just watched uh, something from the uh, Oregon Archive. Uh, it was transportation here and there. Something that was probably released in the 30s, but might have been shot earlier. Um, and this is one of those educational films that wasn't really... It was just kind of more, it's like watching the Science Channel, like there's some science there, but there's just a lot of just interesting visuals, and so that's what these films, a lot of these tended to be. Um, here's a real straight up science film, real educational film from our fine friends at um, Cornet Films. This is a col colloidal state and it's beautiful beautiful kodachrome so here we go colloidal state <laughs> All of the following things have something in common. A cloud, a rubber tire, a piece of paper, some plaster, some fresh paint. These totally different things are all examples of colloids, materials in the colloidal state. The colloidal state is only one type of dispersion in which small particles of one material are scattered or dispersed throughout a second material. One way to define a colloid is by comparison with other dispersions. If we mix some copper sulfate crystals in water, they dissolve. They separate into particles of molecular or ionic size. The chemist calls this kind of dispersion a true solution. In a solution, the particles will not settle out. Now we'll make another kind of dispersion. We'll mix white, coarse sand in the water. It doesn't dissolve, but settles out in a short time. We call this kind of dispersion a suspension. But if a material is ground until the particles are very fine, like this white clay, then it neither dissolves nor settles out. This condition is called a colloidal dispersion which is somewhere between a solution and a suspension. To learn more about the relative sizes of particles that form a colloidal dispersion, let's see what we can learn by filtering the solution, the colloid, and the suspension. We find that the solution comes through the filter paper. The colloidal dispersion, too, comes through the filter. But the coarser matter of the suspension, the sand in the water, does not come through the filter. Evidently, the suspension contains the largest particles of our three examples. Both the solution and the colloidal dispersion pass through the filter. Are colloidal particles, then, as small as the molecular particles of solutions? Perhaps we can answer the question with this experiment. Let's mix a salt solution and a colloidal dispersion of starch. We'll place the mixture in a bag made of a semi-permeable membrane. We suspend the bag in water. Then we pour in our mixture of a solution and a colloid. Next, we are going to test to see what passed through the membrane into the water. When iodine, a reagent used to test for starch, is added to the bag, it turns blue, showing that starch is still in the bag. Iodine in the surrounding water shows no blue reaction, so starch didn't pass through the membrane. Silver nitrate is a reagent used to test for the chloride ion of salt. 
it does show the presence of salt in the water. So the salt, in solution, passed through the membrane. The starch, in the colloidal state, did not. Colloidal particles, then, must be larger than the molecular-sized particles of solutions. And so particles in a colloidal dispersion are between the smaller size of particles in solutions and the larger particles in suspensions. We have other indications of the relative size of colloidal particles. If we shine a strong light beam through a solution, we can scarcely see the path of the beam. In a colloidal dispersion, the path of the beam is readily visible, reflected by the larger particles of the colloid. This is called the Tyndall effect. We can use the effect of light in another demonstration. We can't see colloidal particles under a microscope, but a light beam shining sideways through a drop of colloidal material reveals tiny points of light reflected by the particles. We notice, too, that these points are in constant, irregular movement. This is called Brownian movement. The reason colloidal particles showed Brownian movement is that smaller particles, molecules, were constantly striking them, something like this, causing them to remain in suspension. Colloidal and other particles are measured in extremely small units, millimicrons. A millimicron is one millionth of a millimeter, or one twenty-five millionth of an inch. Particles about 250 millimicrons or more in diameter show the properties of a suspension. Particles one millimicron or less are molecular and show the properties of a solution. Between the two, say between one and one hundred millimicrons, are colloidal particles. Here's another way we can get some idea of the relative size of colloidal particles. Here are thousands of grains of sand. If we were to take just a single grain of sand and look at it under magnification, we'd see this. Within this one grain, we could put hundreds of colloidal particles. So far, we've discussed colloids which were solid particles dispersed in liquids. But as we saw earlier, there are other types of colloids. Let's see the different ways that matter can form colloidal dispersions. We know that matter can exist in three states, as solids, liquids, or gases. Any one state can be dispersed in any other, so there are nine possible pairs of dispersion. Solids dispersed in solids, in liquids, in gases. Liquids in solids, in liquids, and in gases. Gases in solids, in liquids, and in gases. Let's see examples of each pair of dispersions. Carbon black particles dispersed in the rubber of a tire are an example of a solid dispersed in a solid. Paint is an example of a solid in a liquid. A solid in a gas is smoke, tiny solid particles dispersed in air. Butter is a liquid in a solid, that is, water in butter fat. Many hand lotions are liquids in liquids, such as oils in water. Some very fine sprays, such as aerosols, are liquids dispersed in gases, such as oil in air. Plaster of Paris is a gas, air, dispersed in a solid, calcium sulfate. When you whip cream, you're making a colloidal dispersion of a gas, air, in a liquid, cream. What about a gas dispersed in a gas? Here we're going to mix chlorine and bromine. In the mixing flask, the two gases are forming a dispersion. But we should remember that this is a mixture of molecular-sized particles, and that defines a solution, not a colloid. Therefore, a mixture of two gases is not a colloidal dispersion. So we have then eight 
possible combinations of matter in different states that may produce colloidal dispersions. We saw some of the eight combinations that can give us a variety of colloids, but they are all made in two principal ways. We know that particles too fine to settle out of their dispersing medium will form a colloid. So one general way to make a colloidal dispersion is to break matter down to particles of colloidal size. A great many colloids are made by mechanical means. In this mill, coarse solid particles are ground down to colloidal size small enough to be dispersed thoroughly in a liquid medium. This mill grinds pigments mixed with an oil base to form a colloidal paint. Sometimes, in dispersing one liquid in another, we run into difficulty. You've probably seen vinegar and salad oil mixed together. It is difficult to break up the oil droplets finely enough to stay suspended. They tend to merge together, to coalesce to larger size, and come out of suspension. To make them stay suspended, we need an emulsifier. In this case, we're going to use egg yolk as our emulsifier. When we add the emulsifier to the two liquids, vinegar and oil, we find that the oil will stay in suspension. The emulsifier forms a protective film around the oil droplets, preventing them from coalescing into larger than colloidal size. This particular emulsion, or colloidal dispersion of two liquids, is a familiar one. It's mayonnaise, oil and vinegar emulsified with egg yolk. Just as we can prepare colloidal dispersions by grinding matter down to extremely fine size, we can make colloidal particles in a second way. Instead of breaking down particles, we can also build them up. In a solution, we can coagulate or build up molecular-sized particles to larger colloidal-sized particles. When we add ferric chloride to boiling water, for instance, reddish hydrated ferric this colloidal dispersion was made chemically by combining molecular-sized particles to form the larger colloidal-sized particles. The colloidal particles of the same substance have the same electrical charges. In this case, they are the positive charges. Since the positively charged particles repel each other, they stay separated in suspension. However, if we neutralize the positive charges, the particles could become larger than colloidal size and precipitate out. In other words, having made a colloid chemically, we can destroy it chemically. One way to do this is to add an electrolyte to the colloidal dispersion. Negatively charged ions in this electrolyte will be adsorbed by the colloidal particles and neutralize their charges. Watch what happens as we neutralize the positive charges on the colloidal particles. As the particles are neutralized, they clump together or coalesce and begin to precipitate out. So it is possible to destroy a colloid chemically. Later we'll see what value this has. Another way to destroy a colloid is by use of a strong electric field which we can apply in this tube. We introduce smoke, which is a colloid, with electrically charged particles. A current through the wire neutralizes the charges on the smoke particles. They drop out of suspension. It's obvious what use this process might have. The problem of industrial smoke abatement is being solved by the principle we just saw, by electrical precipitation of the colloid, which is smoke. But this is only one way in which an understanding of colloids is useful to us. For instance, tanning leather involves precipitating colloids chemically. The hides, which are made into our shoes and other leather goods, are largely protein colloids. Liquid latex, another colloid, is coagulated in the process of making rubber. In another phase of rubber manufacture, liquid latex is precipitated electrically onto rubber forms. Once more, precipitation of a colloid. A component of milk, casein, 
can be precipitated chemically by acids or by an enzyme called rennet. The precipitated casein can be dried, as we see here. Casein has important industrial uses. Much of the casein made today is used as a coating for paper to improve the quality. A more recent and growing use of casein is in the preparation of high-protein foods, such as this cereal. Edible casein is also added to certain kinds of ice cream. Casein is used as a binding medium for some of our household paints. We constantly use the products and principles of colloidal dispersions in hundreds of practical ways. Soaps and detergents, for instance, are emulsifiers. Washing involves forming an emulsion of oily dirt particles and water, an emulsion that carries the dirt off the skin. Many of our foods are colloids. Homogenized milk is milk in which the fat particles have been broken down to colloidal size so that the cream doesn't separate out. The dyes that color our fabrics owe much of their tinting power to colloidal properties. These are only a few of the thousands of ways we put to use our knowledge of materials in the colloidal state. Wow, today is like a vocabulary day. Not only did we have uh, colloidal, poly polyglot, casein, and then they said protein. Um, I would love to find out when, where in the timeline of uh, Western culture uh, the pronunciation changed from protein to protein. Um, there is definitely, I have films that say protein, I have some that say protein. And I feel like it's in the 60s somewhere. It sort of like switches. Um, protein. All right, uh, let's watch something on the uh, our good friend, the uh, Telecine that we have right over there. Um, this is a way that we can pull films from the stacks in the back and watch it live. So this one is called, um, what is this called? Uh, smoking, light up. Strike out. Enjoy. You know it's produced some amazing things. But one little miracle stands far above the rest. Listen to some clues and see if you can guess. Delivers good taste when you need it bad. Refreshes you when you're down and sad. Gives your fingers an excuse for play. Covers up when you've got nothing to say. Makes you feel like you're accepted. Gives you an air to be respected. Makes you manly if you're a man. Matures kids faster than nature can. And adds a nice touch of sophistication. What is this miracle? By now you've guessed, I bet. It's the all-time favorite, Class A cigarette. Delivers good taste when you need it bad. <laughs> Tastiest smoke she's ever had. Makes you manly if you're a man. Hard to see how smoking can. Refreshes you when you're down and sad. You know, that's really an insulting ad. And adds a nice touch of sophistication. That's what the ad men say, okay. And a lot of people buy it. 60 years ago, cigarettes were about as common as <laughs> snow in June. Not that tobacco was unknown. But a smoking woman was about as rare as eggs from a rooster. Tobacco was used worldwide even before cigarettes had caught on, but they were about to set the world on fire. 
far less trouble than pipes. Cheaper than cigars. Standard issue to the armies in the Second World War. Promoted in the movies and touted in the ads. By the 50s and the 60s, cigarettes were quite a fad. 1960 saw 500 billion cigarettes sold in one year alone. That's more than 4,000 for every man, woman, and child. Regular, king size, then 100 millimeters long, next 120, who knows where it will end. Cigarette money comes pouring in and millions are plowed back into advertising, sowing seeds for bumper crops of new smokers. In the 60s came bad news. Reports flooded in from all over the world. Scientific reports. Conclusion, always the same. Smoking cigarettes is plain unhealthy. They tied cigarette smoking to lung cancer, heart disease, chronic bronchitis, Oh, you know all the rest. It's old news. A lot of folks got real scared and gave up smoking. More than 20 million, and the number's growing daily. Others tried to forget what they knew was true and kept right on smoking. And all the time, ad men are easing new young people, teens and even kids, into the strange world of smoking. a dollar a day adds up to thousands. People pollution, no less. Stains a whole case of toothpaste can't scrub away. Oh, sure. Delivers good taste when you need it bad. Refreshes you when you're down and sad. Gives your fingers excuse for play. Covers up when you've nothing to say. Makes you feel like you're accepted. Gives you an air to be respected. Makes you manly if you're a man. Matures kids faster than nature can. And adds a nice touch of sophistication. Now who's kidding who? I was smoking by 16. My friends set the example and I followed right along. Starting was easy, but quitting was very hard. What starts a person smoking? I know a reason why. First and foremost, I suspect, is that they're somewhat shy. Not too confident of their own ideas, it's easy to follow another's lead. Their closest friends begin to smoke, and pretty soon they feel the need. Bandwagon psychology. Hard pressure to resist. Everyone likes the hayride. But which ride do you choose? More than half the young adults decide it's not the trip for them. I started when I was 13. It seemed like the cool thing to do. Somehow that cigarette makes you look grown up. Why do teens start smoking? I know a reason why. One simple reason, you can bet. One simple reason why some try is that they are no longer kids. They want to look mature. Those cigarettes seem oh so cool. A grown-up habit, that's for sure. Wanting to grow up, well, that's healthy. Only thing is, smoking is an unhealthy way to do it. I mean, smoking makes you grow old in the wrong kind of way. You can't go out for sports and do your best and still smoke. Light up, strike out. I kid myself by saying I need a cigarette to get started in the morning. Used to be that men did most of the smoking, but the girls are making up for lost time. They're beating the guys at their own game. 
You've come a long way, baby. Whatever the reason for starting, smokers almost always discover it's easy to start and hard to stop. Each smoke calls for another. The pleasures, well, they're mostly imagined, but the nuisances are real. An expensive habit that's hard to kick. All in all, it's a very bad deal. It's like gambling. About one heavy smoker in seven loses permanently. I mean, he pays with his life. Truth is, nobody who plays this game wins. Seems the admin have been trying hard to show that smoking's the last word. But the ads could tell a truer tale, truer instead of so absurd. What can you do with the one that shows a cool mountain stream? Do? Oh, you mean turn it to the truth. How about changing it to the hot waters of Yellowstone, smoky and full of chemicals? Right on. Here's one for you. Fix the cowboy whose rugged life calls for a manly cigarette. Make him running from the range fire he started the last time he lit up. And then there's the one that tries to make smoking appear sexy. I know. Give the girl a can of room deodorizer. And don't forget the guy who would rather fight than switch. Yeah, and to complete the picture, his lungs should be black too. Oh, but I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Who can take on the girl who thinks smoking is sophisticated? Oh, that's easy. How about this? You know, it all comes down to a bottom line. If you're thinking about smoking, maybe you even started, think about it hard. Don't just ease into it. It's your decision. No one but you can make it. If you come right down to it, there isn't one good reason to smoke. Not one. Trouble is, it takes guts not to. Think about it. It's easy to start, hard to stop. And, and you're, you're not, not buying, buying acceptance. acceptance. You're, you're not, not buying relaxation. relaxation. You're, you're not buying refreshment. You're, you're not buying sophistication. sophistication. That's what the admins say, I know. But they're good at talking double. What you're buying, it's the honest truth, is a, a great big pack of trouble. <coughs> 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 I mean, you know, you could argue like a lot of drug films is a, an ad for it, and it's certainly trying to punch holes in uh, tobacco ads, but it also is just reinforcing um, our society's love of cigarettes. Um, so, yeah, it's a fascinating film. Uh, speaking of vices, um, you can support us by um, buying us coffee. Uh, caffeine is our vice that stimulates our nervous systems and occasionally overstimulates. Um, and you can go to the link buymeacoffee.com slash avgeeks and buy us some coffee. That's one way, like I said, to say thank you. Another way is to go to avgeeks.com and see other things that we have online and buy us DVDs. You can also tell the world that you like AV Geeks by hitting like, subscribe, ringing some sort of notica notification bell icon, commenting, sharing, all that stuff. So it's pretty great. All right, let's see, what, what do we got next? Um, watching that uh, colloidal state film made me think about this film, which involves um, making a stink bomb. So here's Other People's Property. It's, uh, it's a Centron film. It's cut. The title's cut at the beginning, but it's still pretty great. Here we go. Other People's Property. Even in your grade, even. And what happened to them might have happened to you. You see, they had a plan. 
a plan to do something, but they didn't stop to think what the consequences of that plan might be. And now they're in trouble, real trouble. Jimmy is just plain scared. Golly, what do you suppose is going to happen to us now? Oh, uh, they'll probably kick us out of school activities for a month, but I don't care if they do. This is sure going to hurt my mother and dad. Oh, what are you always worrying about your mother and dad for? They aren't going to hear anything about this. Gee, but they might even kick us out of school. I'd hate to face my folks if they did that. Golly, if I had it to do over, I'd sure do it different. Another chance? Do you really think you deserve another chance? You planned this, Frank. It was all your idea. What do you think about your fine idea now? And you, Jimmy, how do you feel? Although you didn't plan it, you really didn't give any thought to how it might turn out, did you? To you, it just seemed fun and a good idea at the time, but you did join in. But Dale now, you could have stopped it. You knew it was wrong, and you knew where it had a good chance of leading. Then why did you do it? I knew it was wrong. I knew we shouldn't do it, and I tried to tell them. But they said I was just a chicken, and after all, they're my friends. And sometimes you have to do some things for friends that you don't like to do. Why did you do it, Jimmy? Well, Frank said he wanted to do it. He said it sure would be funny. And he was right. It was awful funny for a while. It isn't any fun now, though. How about you, Frank? What do you have to say? As far as I'm concerned, you can thank old man Kraft. He deserves something. Making me stay in because he caught me throwing paper wads. I wasn't the only one. Made me miss the ball game, too. But I got even with him, and I still don't care. You don't care, Frank? Well, at least you didn't care what happened to Mr. Kraft that day he kept you in after school. In fact, you thought of lots worse than to Jimmy and Dale. Remember how... And remember how Dale hung back and didn't think it was such a good idea, but how you and Jimmy persuaded him? And how he came along with you just because he was your friend? And remember how you went to the drugstore and bought the stuff? And then you went down in Jimmy's basement, and you tried just a little bit of it, just to see how it smelled. Boy, how he does hey. that stink! Boy, it sure does. That stuff will work fine. I can hardly wait to see old Kraft's face. Golly, do you think we ought to? That stuff's awful. What if it hurts something? What do we care? What's the matter? Are you gonna chicken on us? Yeah, you going chicken? Well, no, I just thought that... Okay, let's do it. And do you remember the next day, how you three waited through that class, waiting for the end of the period? Remember how the closer it came to the time, the harder it was to keep your eyes off that waste paper basket where you had decided to play your trick? Remember how you felt then? Remember? Boy, it won't be long now. This old school's really going to see something. Sure will stink. This will get even with old Kraft, all right. Sure will be funny. I wonder if Dale's right, though. I wonder if we might hurt something. I wonder if that stuff might blow up. No, nah, we tried it. Maybe it'd be better if we didn't do it today. Maybe we ought to wait a little bit. Nope, can't do that. Jimmy and Dale would think I was scared if I backed out now. I'll just have to go through with it. Remember how you felt that day, Jimmy? I can hardly wait till Frank gets that stuff going. I'll bet this old room's gonna smell worse than it ever smelled before. Frank's always thinking up things to do. Wonder why I never have any good ideas. Yes, it's going to be funny when old man Kraft gets a whiff of that stuff. And do you remember what you were thinking? We shouldn't do it. We just shouldn't. I know I was right. Something might happen. Might even start a fire. Somebody might get hurt. And it would be all my fault. I should have stopped it. I should have made Frank give up the idea. I wonder if I could stop it now. 
I could go tell Mr. Kraft, but I'd have to do it before class was over and everybody would see me. And I'd get Jimmy and Frank into trouble. They wouldn't like me anymore. No one would like me because I tattled. No, I guess there's nothing I can do about it now. If each of you had stopped to think, you would have given the whole thing up. But you didn't. You waited until Mr. Kraft dismissed class. Then you quickly put the sack of chemicals into the waste paper basket. It worked just the way you thought it would. Except you used much more of the stuff this time than when you used his basement. No wonder everyone thought the school was on fire. No one thing still seems almost like a nightmare to you, even now. Yes, the chemicals worked all right, but not the way you thought they would. The school fire bell broke up the important dress rehearsal for the class play. You hadn't counted on that. The city fire department was called out. You hadn't counted on that either. And the fumes, so bad they made some of your classmates sick. You hadn't counted on the fumes at all. Classes in part of the school had to be let out because of the fumes. You know how you felt then, but it was too late. The damage was done. Sure, it was expensive of your little prank. Well, let's see. The classroom was so badly damaged that it has to be completely redecorated. Painting costs money. And since classes had to be dismissed, time was lost. Time which had to be made up, not only by you, but by all your classmates. But most of all, there was the feeling you had when you saw the damage you had done. The feeling that changed from fun to fear and finally to shame. And then there were the eyes that saw you come out of the classroom, running away from what you had done. There were the lips that told of what the eyes had seen. And there were the ears that heard then there were the looks and the thoughts of your classmates when they learned that you were to blame for all this. And finally, there was the note that brought you to the principal's office. For God's sakes, Dale, why don't you quit worrying about it? Sure, we might as well face it. Oh, we're not the only ones. What about those guys drawing pictures in the washroom? What about the time when all those kids broke the windows? Sure, and the carved up desks in Miss Smith's room. The library books that were marked up last week. We're not the only ones who've done stuff around here. Gee whiz, you don't think that excuses us, do you? There's no getting around it. What we did was wrong, and we all know it now. All right, boys. Come in, please. Well, Frank, Jimmy, Dale, what do you think about it now? And what about you? You who have watched this film, if you had been in this situation at the beginning, would you have stopped to think about the damage you might cause to other people's property? What do you think was the real reason Frank acted as he did? What would you have done if you had been Jimmy? Do you think Dale would have preferred not to join Frank and Jimmy? Why? What do you think? So I lost track of um, which boy was who, um, but one of them was in uh, manners in school with uh, Chalky, uh, and he was also malcontent in that film. Uh, but thankfully, a animated chalk drawing convinced him to um, have better manners in school. But obviously, it didn't take once he entered middle school. Um, wow, such a great film! Very much enjoyed that. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Let's see, doing some searching. All right, uh, so this next film uh, is related to Cassian. Uh, it's, uh, at the beginning, it's warped a little bit, so the frames will roll, but it's still an amazing film. It's The Miracle of Milk. <laughs>
this is the round ball you and I live on. This is our planet, as it is now, and as it was long ago, in the gray beginning of time. Its lifeless, wrinkled skin takes many forms. This we call rock. This we call water. This is sand. And this is soil. Rock, water, sand, and soil, the crust of man's earth. Yet from this dead crust comes life. Yes, all growing, breathing things are merely different combinations. The process is kept going only by conversion of these earth elements into nourishment. Nourishment for the vegetable world as it feeds directly, consuming important calcium, phosphates, iron, through an elaborate system of roots and leaves. Nourishment for the animal world, feeding indirectly. Herbivorous or plant-eating animals absorbing their essential foods after the vegetable world has taken them from the earth. Carnivorous or meat-eating animals, obtaining their nourishment after earth minerals have passed through another stage, become flesh. Man is an omnivorous animal. Man can absorb his natural nourishment from the earth crust in either form. Man can eat meat. Man can eat roots and greens, leaves, seeds, berries, and fruit. And one very special item, abounding in most of the elements of which life itself is composed, fresh milk. Fresh milk, limited to and characteristic of mammals, produced for one purpose only, to supply complete nourishment, has, since the days before history, been a staple in man's diet, is well nigh perfect food. Early man was a hunter who killed to live. Early man followed a loosely organized tribal existence. Milk brought him out of the caves, down from the cliffs into a more ordered society, where domesticated herds were always close at hand, a food supply kept under control. And as man sought more abundant pastures for his precious goats, sheep, and cattle, he inscribed the first pages of recorded history with sagas of great migrations. The Old Testament refers many times to a promised land flowing with milk and honey. Thus milk helped shape the course of civilization. Museums preserve evidence of high regard for cattle in ancient Babylon and Greece. Sometimes the bull was considered divine. Sometimes he was offered to the gods as a treasured possession. No Egyptian pharaoh was laid to rest without necessities he would require in the world beyond. Symbolic miniature cows were commonplace in every tomb. In classic Rome, at the time of the Caesars, Many an aristocrat in her bath believed milk applied externally brought health and beauty. Even in those days, it was perceived that milk, health and beauty somehow went together. Today, American women use milk for health and beauty, but they know how and why. They know that a clear skin, sound white teeth, attractive hair, lovely nails are impossible without enough calcium. And of all foods, milk is the richest source of calcium. And as for slenderness, we'll just ask any Hollywood actress how she keeps her figure. In India, for centuries, the cow has been considered sacred, tended with reverent care, treated with utmost respect. And modern America has her sacred cows, more pampered, given more lavish attention than any sacred cow of India. Elaborate machinery of the 20th century, America's way of showing respect for milk, science applied to the instinctive practices of eras long past. Solicitude and care based not on blind instinct, but upon knowledge. Here there is more than age-old respect for the cow, here, there is intelligent reverence for sanitation and cleanliness.
For man's most nearly perfect food must be kept free of contamination from the source to the table. Yes, contemporary research has proved what the ancients believed, that nature's own food is most nearly perfect for man. And the intuitive ritual of yesterday is strikingly paralleled by the hygienic procedure of today. Though steel is big, far-flung, though wheat is tremendous, extensive, though automobiles are impressive, rank high, dairying is equally potent. With billions of dollars invested in farms and equipment, with more billions invested in blooded cattle, the dairy industry does a three and a half billion dollar business a year. In the USA now, there are 25 million cows, representing many famous breeds. Twenty-five million cows, one for every five persons, a large bovine population. While milk comprises one quarter of the national diet, authorities agree that if we were all to drink as much milk as we should, America would have not 25, but 40 million cows, producing natural food in a living laboratory. Food for all mammals, young and old. Designed by nature primarily for nourishment of the young, milk is more easily digested than any other food. Yet here is no sissy drink. In the world of sport, milk is standard equipment. High in energy, tissue, and bone building elements, milk is basic in the diet of every athlete. But even more than the athlete, the average person requires milk to build up resistance. Rich in the vitamin that many staple foods lack, vitamin A, which counteracts infection, maintains general body tone, milk is one of the most important protective foods. And as nature originally intended, milk today is one of the most economical foods. Housewives everywhere have learned that. In a great state, such as New York, many carefully planned factors make this possible. Organized production beginning in the country, receiving depots at strategic points, efficient labor and time-saving devices, every step along the way carefully supervised by state and local health agencies. And the dairy industry itself maintains complete laboratories where highly trained technicians examine, test, maintain purity. That calories and vitamins are present in full force is shown by frequent and thorough testing of butterfat content. With efficiency, cleanliness. Constantly, equipment is dismantled, washed, sterilized. In the marketing of milk, every second counts. Bright gleaming pipes lead into a gleaming bright bottling plant. Inside, a steady flow of milk runs down through heating units, passes into intricate, carefully controlled pasteurizing apparatus. Sparkling containers scrupulously scrubbed, and now bathed in ultraviolet rays. There's no waste of minutes or of milk. These are important reasons why milk quality is outstanding in the state of New York. Here, pure and rich in the vital elements of which life itself is composed, here is an unexcelled, economical, but complete source of health and vigor for every citizen of the state. Fresh milk, nature's greatest food. Will you ever forget your first time on stage? Mom said my entrance was dazzling, but when my knees stopped knocking, I enjoyed it. Backstage, the main attraction was Kool-Aid. What better way to celebrate, then or now?
Compare it to soda, including my sugar, Kool-Aid unsweetens about one-third the price, has vitamin C, plus a fruity taste that's a real showstopper. You loved it as a kid, you trust it as a mother. Kool-Aid brand unsweetened soft drink mix. Between meals, I think it's the perfect time for Snickers. Satisfying. I'm starving, you know, and your stomach is turning. And you say, oh, I know what I'll get. And then you go down to the vending machine, and you grab one of your Snickers. It's so satisfying. Snickers is loaded with peanuts. Peanuts and peanut butter nougat, caramel and milk chocolate. Satisfying. Snickers satisfies me. Packed with peanuts, Snickers really satisfies. The Snickers bars really takes away the hungry. Looking neat, tasting sweet, lip gloss. Lip gloss lockets from the Princess Play Cosmetics Collection. Fun lockets full of flavored lip gloss. Strawberry, orange, chocolate chip, mmm, mint ice cream. Looking neat, tasting sweet, lip gloss. Mmm, lip gloss lockets. Lip gloss lockets, strawberry, chocolate chip, orange, and mint ice cream flavors. Each sold separately by Mego. Good manager, you gotta be smart. See, I even have to make sure the drinks are cold. So I got this Izzo Playmate cooler. It's got this handle, so it's easy to carry, but it's big enough to hold ice and 18 drinks. One for everyone on both teams. The little Playmate holds nine drinks. Like I said, you gotta be smart. The Playmates by Igloo. Yeah, I just found those commercials um, on a file on a drive that I didn't realize that I had. So those are pretty great. And Miracle of Milk, man, <laughs> Western civilization, the world as we know it would not exist without milk. Um, yeah, they lay it on pretty thick, pretty creamy thick uh, milk. Um, and I think that, as I was saying, I've said a couple of times, a lot of films about nut nutrition were actually by dairy councils and dairy organizations, and they inserted themselves, the dairy, as part of, uh, you know, whatever food group. And uh, around that time, there were two food groups. There was uh, protective uh, food groups, and I think there was uh, bodybuilding. I can't, I can't remember, but it's it's really kind of interesting. Um how they kind of insert themselves and show up, especially because some people can't tolerate it and some cultures uh, can't tolerate um, cow's milk. And so, you know, is it really good for you? I mean, it's convenient uh, in its nutritional value, but is it really important? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, anyways, uh, the one thing that we do know that is good for us in spite of it is coffee. So you can buy some coffee. Uh, also, you can go get some DVDs and see other shows that we've done and hit like and subscribe and all that stuff. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so over the next couple of days, I might be doing this remotely. I haven't quite figured out if it's going to work, but uh, I'll let you know. At the very least, it might be something that I upload. Uh, it depends on the internet connection. Um, but I got to continue doing it because this, I think tomorrow is the 365th show that we've done. So we've done literally a year's worth of screenings um, over a, the course of 14 months or so. And uh, just want to keep going because we got so many more films. I mean, like I said, I just found those commercials. Uh, I didn't know that they were there. So there's lots and lots and lots of stuff to watch. And I'm so happy that you guys are there to watch it with us. So everybody have a great rest of your day. And, uh, you know, as always, I look inside that film can to teach me things, and it tells me to please rewind and love each other. And um, those are pretty good words to follow. Love yourself as well, because you need care, man. You need uh, someone to take care of yourself, and you are the closest person. So there's my um, two-cent philosophy of life. Uh, everybody have a good rest of your day, and we will see you tomorrow. I think. Take care.